Welcome back, everyone. Here with another short Q and A. Anything that I say is not meant to diagnose you. Check with your doctor before implementing any of the things that we're going to suggest. We have a lot to talk about. Let's just dive right in, Steve. What do you think? Very good. I agree, and uh, we love all the components of the show: the green room, social media, the questions, your commentary. But let's start off with social media, since there's so many folks there. So, Sarah from YouTube, thanks for chiming in. What can cause allergic reactions to food, but results uh, for those same foods negative? Let's see. So what can an allergic, but it's, uh, so she's got uh, allergic reactions, but everything's testing uh, negative. Mm -hmm. I've had some thyroid yeah. nodules removed and have bad reactions in particular to walnuts, spinach, and strawberries, but the test results are negative. What a bummer. Help, doctor. It could be something else, not an allergy. It could be oxalates especially in nuts spinach and other foods like chocolate and things like that <clears throat> so yeah it's not just that um you also have um, a true allergy has to involve a protein so like if it's not a protein how can somebody be allergic to it there's a lot of other things in foods lectins tannins phytates that can irritate the body um and even like like milk, for example, you can have an allergy to the milk protein casein, and you can also have um, an intolerance to the, the sugar, so lactose intolerance. So, in other words, um, it might not be a true allergy, but you need to avoid it because your body is saying no to it for a certain reason. It could be something in the food. You know, for some reason, um, I think I'm allergic to Doritos, uh, I don't have an allergy, but my body just reacts to it. I don't know what's going on with that, Steve. Wow. Well, uh, that's uh, hopeful words for her. Hopefully that helps, um, you know, have her search in some other areas. And here we are from Rumble. And by the way, Rumble, we're so happy and proud to have you on board. You have just shown the world and YouTube that, you know, diminishing free speech, uh, you know, can cause people to move and migrate to other areas. And I'm glad that you're up there because you are, uh, the numbers on Rumble are just skyrocketing. And speaking of Rumble, Emily from Rumble, please discuss how raising the body's temperature could be helpful in fighting a fever. Would a sauna, that's interesting, or heated mattress uh, be helpful? Yeah, both viruses and bacteria um, don't like to tolerate heat too much. So you can actually cook them uh, through a fever or generating a fever through a sauna or hot shower bath and then getting really uh, warm and then climbing in the bed with covers so you can sweat it out. Um, that'll, that will decrease the duration of the infection to make the environment not really friendly for the microbes. Um, so... That's why when someone starts to get a fever, the worst thing you can do is like, oh, let's let's take an aspirin or some Tylenol to get rid of the fever. I'm like, now you just prolong the <laughs> prolong the illness because now we have an increased duration of that infection. So, yeah, you want to stay warm anytime you have an infection. Wow, interesting. So suffer a little bit more and get rid of the darn thing quicker. Uh, we've got a great lineup in the green room, and one my friend Nor from Sweden has. Uh, been waiting patiently at the beginning and nor if you would unmute yourself i'm going to do the same thing and then we're going to have you ask your question about your wife in 30 seconds for dr berg go ahead yes uh hello dr berg hello uh, hello uh, my name is nor i uh, want to discuss with you about my wife disease she got idiopathic intracranial hypertension last year in may and she she have been diagnosed for it, and uh, the X-ray have showed like uh, she ha uh, she has a narrow transverse sinus vein on the left side and a small pituitary gland, and she get operated for a stent in the <clears throat> transverse sinus vein. And uh, her version, it's getting worse after the operation, should I say. She, uh, it have been about 50, uh, she, had, uh, she has a 56% vision in the left eye and 100% correct vision in the right eye. But after the, uh, the surgery, she got 20% uh, left on the left eye and 80%. Uh, 
So we need to discuss about uh, this disease, the idiopathic intracranial hypertension with you, actually. <laughs> That's a, a really common disease. No, it's not. So what? So was it a, a, a pineal disorder or a usip pituitary? Usip pituitary was shrunk, I think. Yeah, exactly. A small pituitary gland. Yeah. It's have shown in x-ray. Yeah, so this is what I would do. Obviously, they... They had to enter, did they enter her eye or did they go through the skull? Where did they go? I mean, uh, um, uh, she, uh, she, uh, she has a swollen optic nerve. And no, how did they go? How did they go? How did they do the surgery? Through the eye? No, 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 not through the eye. Through the, from here, like, oh, they I went don't know how to explain, through, through the nerve. Oh, oh okay. 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 Yeah, All right. exactly. so, so this is what I would do from a natural viewpoint. I would, um, I would uh, search out a standard process product. It's called uh, pituitrophin PMG and take mm -hmm. one before bed. Um, it, it doesn't have any hormones or anything like that, but it, it tends to normalize uh, the um, pituitary gland. So uh, that's something that I've used in the past with people that had all sorts of malfunctions with the pituitary. It seems to work pretty good in some cases. So I would, I would, it's worth a try. And of course, go to the, the basic, you know, you know, you could, you know, we're dealing with uh, symptoms right now. So I would go to the basic eating plan, make sure she's on that just to help uh, stabilize the foundation of her health uh, with that and, and also do some periodic prolonged fasting, which uh, uh, has been shown to really help um, to speed up the healing process. Because in reality, the healing is only going to come from her home, home body. So we just have to enhance it and not do anything that interferes with that healing. So um, we want to stay out of the way, support a little bit and let the body take its course. But that's really all, all I'm going to recommend. Okay. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, she has a swollen optic nerve so also mm -hmm. and papilledema, it's called, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, so this is, this is why the fasting, so you can, it helps get rid of edema, swelling and yeah. uh, inflammation and probably some vitamin D and then just let the body do its thing. Okay. All right, well, Thank you. Nor, we really, our hearts go out to you and your wife, and that sounds like some serious stuff, and we'd love to hear back with some positive news from you that she's healing and her vision's good. And uh, so uh, love from America and around the world to your family. And hope. Uh, Thank you very much. Up. Thank back. you very much. Thanks for coming in. All right, let's see, Doc. Well, that sounds pretty serious. Okay, let's go to something that uh, is not as serious, and that's our quiz questions, which are really fun each week. And, Nora, I hope you and your wife will look at this and see what you think. And there it is, Doc. All right. Which country in the world has the longest life expectancy? Wow. I think it's Arkansas or Alabama. <laughs> yeah, you're probably close, Steve. <laughs> not being a country, but you know what I mean. All right, let's see. Uh, let's go back to social media. Beautiful audio is the handle from this person, again on Rumble. Dr. Burr, could you please do a video on the best remedies for nasal congestion? Bet you have. I'm sure many of us would benefit from your advice. Thank you from beautiful audio. Yeah, you know, I, I have uh, quite a few. You should look them up uh, under sinus. I have just typed Dr. Berg and then that item, I have a ton of great data. Uh, I always do upgrades uh, with these videos when I find something new. So uh, I think you'll be happy with the, um, what we have so far, uh, especially if you can identify, is it, you know, seasonal or is it all year round? Um, and then apply what I say in those videos because it definitely works. All right, very good. Well, we've had... Um a few requests for people to want to see what the disembodied uh, voice uh, on the show is, and uh, that would be me. They want to see what I look like. So audience, brace yourself. 
Uh, but I'm a small part of the show because we also have Terry, but unfortunately Terry fell out of an ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. A terrible tragedy. Plus he doesn't have a camera, so we can't show him to. Actually, I'm scared that you might consider him more handsome than I am, so I'm just going to keep him incognito in the background. But here I am, for what it's worth, audience having a blast with uh, Dr. Berg, and that's all you get. So. Well, I'm just going to have a new nickname for you, Steve, Mr. Appropriate. How about that? <laughs> well, look, I can't Mr. help it. How about well, that? <laughs> I know. Well, these things happen in nature, and there's not a darn thing I can do about it. So, Terry, at least you can type and so on. But, uh, yeah, they're not uh, for public consumption as far as I'm concerned. He'll beat the crap out of me the next time he sees me. Trust me. So there'll be a payback. Cindy from Facebook, can natural progesterone cream slow our metabolism? No, no, I think it, it can help, especially for um, the majority of women when they reach menopause, where progesterone just tanks to near zero. And definitely the ratios of the estrogen to progesterone are going to be off because they're going to show, even though you might be low on estrogen, the ratio is going to be so far off that um, it's going to look like you have high estrogen, which you really don't. But yeah, progesterone is definitely a... a um, hole in the bucket for many women over the uh, menopause, but it, sometimes you can take DHEA or even pregnenolone to beef up uh, the um, um, various hormones that are connected to that. So um, it's always good to get tested to see if what you need and before you start taking a bunch of things, but yeah, I'm not against progesterone cream at all. All right, good. Have at it. TB from YouTube, I'm new to keto, congratulations, six days in and now feeling much better. Amazing how that happens. However, cauliflower gives me an upset stomach. Should I stop eating it? Uh, let's mm -hmm. see, ironically, you should. yeah, well, there you go. Ironically, broccoli you does should. not bother my stomach. You know, I have just the opposite uh, thing. I, I can't do broccoli, but I can do cauliflower. So yeah, so you, the key to know if a food is good for you is what does it do to your digestion? Does it bloat you? Then avoid it. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Let's move along. Lou from YouTube, my blood ketones are at 0 .07, excuse me, and my urine ketones are at 8 after 3 hours of fasting. Uh, why the discrepancy and are those numbers good enough to burn fat? So in your urine these ketones are being wasted, right? It's like basically fat chunks that are coming out of your body, which is a good thing, right? You're also breathing out um, these ketones. So what happens um, initially when you start ketosis is that your body is, a, is switching over and adapting to burning more fat as ketones. In the process, it's not very efficient. And so you waste ketones. But as you become more efficient and you start utilizing the ketones, um, you're no longer going to find ketones in your urine anymore. You'll find them in your blood, but not in the urine. So that's why it's the urine is not a good place to assess ketones. Um, maybe it's good in the beginning just to get an idea, but soon you're going to adapt and you're not going to find them there anymore. All right, very good. Quiz question number one was eaten up by the audience, which asked, which country in the world has the longest life expectancy? And overwhelmingly, 95% of our respondents say it was Japan. And then the sprinkling of the last 5% uh, was China, Morocco, Greece, Costa Rica, India, and Italy. India, come on, a lot of carbs down there. What do you think, Doc? Japan, Hong Kong. Wow. Why? Um, this is interesting because people always talk about the blue zones and, um, you know, aqua, aqua, um, was it, uh, um, in Japan, um, various, various other places. Um, where's the other, where's some other blue zones? So you have, um, Sardinia, the Mediterranean, but you also have, um, Hong Kong actually has the longest, uh, life. Um, not, not, not sedentarians, but just an average per capita. They're, they live longer. I think it's like 86 years for women, 81 years for men. And um, so I'll, I'll be releasing a video on this. But what's interesting about this is that they have, 
if you compare them to the UK or, or even the US, you know, people think that, um, oh yeah, longevity should be related to how much uh, healthcare per person, right, is provided or, or consumed. Well, they, they don't even compare it to the US. In fact, um, they don't, it's not very organized. They don't go to the doctors as much, but the longevity is better. What a coincidence, right? So, um, you know, just by throwing more money at it doesn't solve the problem. As an example in the US. The other interesting thing about it is that um, they're the country that consumes the most animal meat. So it kind of blows some of the theories out with, uh, oh yeah, you're going to live longer if you don't eat meat. They consume a lot of uh, meat. So that's another interesting point. I'm going to do a video on that um, to go into the details. So stay tuned. That'd be very interesting. That was not what uh, was counterintuitive, I think, in my case. Let's, uh, let's throw out the next uh, question. And here it is, Doc. Okay, true or false? People with a genetic iron excess problem also have anemia, iron deficiency. Another counter counterintuitive thing. Let's see. Jessica from Facebook is suffering from uh, uterine fibroids. Is there any way she can help reduce that issue without surgery? I would start avoiding anything dairy because dairy tends to uh, have hormones in it and can stimulate the growth of things. I would also consume cruciferous, which has an interesting property to increase uh, anti, it has anti-angiogenic properties, so it helps to kind of shrink the blood uh, vessels to certain tumors. Um, and then what I would do is I would do a lot more fasting um, to help um, indirectly bring the body back to a normal level. So uh, I would just do those things. And of course, um, you know, I always relate to the diet. I don't have time to do a history, but usually women that have fibroids are consuming something that is more anabolic. So it's kind of building things up like more insulin type foods. So um, you want to go low carb for sure. Okay, very good. We, we uh, brought in four participants into the green room this week. So we're asking them all to keep it nice and quick. And uh, Gene, would you un... Uh, mute yourself so that we can get you on for your quick question with Dr. Berg. And I'm waiting. She's got kind of a noisy area. There she is. Go, Jean. One question, 30 seconds. Uh, I'm 72, and like, like 27 years ago, we figured out I have a lupus. Hmm. And during those years, uh, gradually, every few years, I have a new symptom, new problem. Hmm. Uh, last year, I went to Taiwan. I'm, I, I'm from Taiwan um, almost 40 years ago. And uh, over there, it, it's uh, pretty, uh, the, pretty convenient to get an advanced checkup, like a CT scan. We pay from our own pocket, not like here. Uh, unless you're almost dying, the, the doctor would, the insurance would not approve your CD scan or whatever. Am I, I do what I want. I consult with my family doctor here. I went to Taiwan to go this only like a three, 400 for a, uh, MRI. And I paid no problem. It's for my health. And then I figure out during the many, many problems and things. The new issue is my C, C uh, uh, artery mm -hmm. calcium the, the score. Co five, yeah, the calc uh, coronary artery calcium score. Right. It's 549. Okay. And I I was always because I, I was always pay attention my on my diet. And uh, I'm work. I have a. Uh, my work. I retire from postal service, so we're active. I'm. A, I was a clerk. Uh, act, a lot of physical activity, and also after retire, I I went to some 
dance class and aerobic class are trying to be very active. And uh, I, but I, after I watch a video, I add more K2 on my D, D3 score. My D3 score, my rheumatology doctor always watch my dose score. Uh, my D2 is always like a 60 or 70s. But now uh, after your video, I take more D, <laughs> D3. And uh, also I uh, pay attention to the K2. And uh, But other than that, how can I reduce mm -hmm. my classification score? I went to see two, two different uh, a cardiology doctor, and they say uh, because the, the stress has shows I'm fine. Mm -hmm. However, but they didn't answer my question. Mm -hmm. I'm still let me waiting. let me give you my two cents, okay? Okay. Yeah, I understand. It's hard to find someone that can really look at all the information and give you the right right thing to do. Because, um, like you kind of get an answer and don't, don't give you the answer. Um, the fact that you had lupus uh, tells us that your inflammatory um, bioindicators are probably higher through the body. So that's probably contributing to that because it's not just in the connective tissue, it could be inflammation somewhere else in the body. So I think that's great that you're taking vitamin K2 and you're taking vitamin D3, especially because vitamin D3. It's going to be important and um, hopefully putting that condition in remission. So there's a couple of things to speed it up. And, you know, it could be worse. You could be a thousand. So we want it zero. So I think uh, I would do what I'm going to tell you in the next maybe six weeks or two months and then re retest it to see if it's coming down. If it's coming down, then you're on the right track. So, um, so this is what I would do. I would take uh, tocotrienols. That is very specific to um, the arteries to tr drop inflammation. Yes, okay. I did. I okay, already good. did. Okay, good. And then the calcium that's building up is a, just a, it's not because you're eating too much calcium. It's because of the uh, inflammatory process. So everything you do needs to reduce inflammation. So I would do a fasting one meal a day. I would do one meal a day. I would, of course, you may even want to consider doing um, carnivore for um, a few months. I'm going to tell you why. Because any type of autoimmune disease starts in the gut. And there could be something going on in the gut that you could really help yourself with, with the uh, symptoms for the lupus, just by doing that. And that will indirectly drop the inflammation. There's one more thing I think um, that's going to be important for you. Uh, especially for the inside of the arteries, is uh, is to take um, niacinamide. Niacinamide is a good one too. And you take 50 milligrams three times a day, not before bed. And um, that's really good for the mitochondria. It's good for the inside of the arteries. It's good for inflammation. How to and spell that? Niacinamide. I and couldn't I... tell you. You'll have to just watch this video and try to find just niacinamide <laughs> n-i-a see something <laughs> yeah I, I i don't know I, can, I, I can write it out but i can't spell it so um and steve as you know i'm a really good speller yeah you and me both terry has to yeah. hold us up so niacinamide right yeah. so do those actions um, and then get another evaluation in maybe two months. And let's say it's getting better. Then don't change anything. Keep going. Let's say it's not getting better. Then you get a metabolomic test, look deeper into the cells to refine what you need. But I, I do understand you just, the mystery is we need a little more information on really what's happening right now. We're kind of, we have some ideas, um, but getting a CAC test doesn't tell you why. It just tells you what's going on. But I can only imagine what's going on based on the lupus. So anyway, that's what I would do right now is uh, my quick answer. 
Okay, Jeannie, listen, thanks for talking to us, but we've blown way past the agreed-upon 30-second question, but we're glad that you're able to talk to us. But do those things that the doctor uh, recommended, and why don't you get back with us? But unfortunately, we're out of time uh, for your particular question, and we wish you all the best. Okay, and Gene, I hope you're watching the questions because we've got an answer for question number two, which was true-false. People with a genetic iron excess problem also have anemia, iron deficiency. And 60% of the audience said it's true, and 40% of our respondents say it's false. Oops, Gene, I'm sorry. I've still got you up there. There you go. Have a nice day there. Um, okay, so, so go ahead. The answer is it's absolutely positively true. Huh. So now how can that be? Like one-third of the population is, an, is anemic, okay, deficient in blood for various reasons. Um, and... So you have that um, deficiency, which is a lot more than the excess, but then you have probably over a, easily over a hundred million people that have um, an excess of iron because our bodies really have no way of getting rid of iron. So if you're taking the Geritol because they promoted it for fatigue and it is true that you can, anemia is fatigue, but also an excess of iron is also fatigue. Why? Because when you have um, too much iron, it becomes unavailable to you. So you're both anemic and then you have the, the terrible destructive element of too much iron that dis destroys the, uh, the tissues, the DNA, it rusts out the organs. So it's like, wow, that's the situation. It's like, you can't really mobilize and use iron. Iron is fascinating because iron is, um, I'm going to do a complete video on this, but um, you got to be careful with taking iron. Um, microbes survive and depend on iron. Cancer depends on iron. And this is why we have all these different mechanisms in the body that um, like lactoferrin, which basically kind of binds up iron to starve off the microbes and just give the iron to your, your microbes and your cells, but not the pathogens. So this this whole battle for iron. They can, certain like staph infections, they go in there and crack open your red blood cells and steal the iron. Um, the microbe in TB um, does the same thing. But there's one microbe that um, can bypass all that and just steal your iron and uh, regardless of this lactoferrin mechanism, and that's uh, H. pylori. So anyway, I'm going to do a video on this, but it's actually fascinating, this war against iron with uh, what microbes and cancers live on. And uh, you can't live without it, and you can't with live too, with too much of it. So we just need just the right amount. And I think that's really a relevant uh, point to, to do a video on, to really understand that, since it, uh, especially as you get older, um, Boy, if your iron is too high, it can just destroy your testosterone, your liver, um, and create problems with the heart. So stay tuned for a video, a full video on that. Well, we can't wait for that. That sounds like scary balance that we got to maintain. And uh, here's our next question, speaking of dangerous things. Okay. Why is it dangerous for a person with insulin resistance to consume a high-carb diet? audience climb on it as i know you will and since we have sort of a full uh, crowd in our green room we are going to now demonstrate how the people from prague czechoslovakia maintain a 30 second question uh and we've got a nice guy named martin who's going to demonstrate that unmute yourself martin and then we're going to put you on for your rapid question there you go now oh, hello greetings from prague i have a very simple question I have something what is called systemic mastocytosis, and I would like to know how to get rid of it. Well, you're going to have to help me out understand what that is because um, I don't even know what that disease is. Well, good question. Before, doctors name it uh, urticaria pigmentosa, which is some red dots on the skin oh yes okay then they rename it on mastocytosis this is how it is now sounds 
sounds pretty scientific, that's for sure. Um, so you have these red or purple spots on your your on the skin? Whole body. Yeah, the my skin here is more uh, red, and on the body I have these dots, or I know if you can see it. Are they, are they, oh, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. So uh, I have, I've done videos on that before, um, but it doesn't look but it's mainly on the lower extremity, but you have them through the whole, whole body. So um, the, the question I, I would want to know mainly is just without trying to give you any medical advice is that um, was there a point in your life where you didn't have it? Mm, I have it like 20 years, but it's mm -hmm. slightly growing more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So can you see I'm under, um, medical check every three months, which is mainly blood tests. Mm -hmm. And they say always, ah, you are healthy, you are okay, you are fine. So see you next three months. So nothing else shows up? No. Okay. Um, yeah, so it looks like it's more of a systemic issue. I mean, when I look at that, I'm, I immediately think of spleen problem. But I think when you have this mysterious thing and nothing shows up, you know, it's really hard to evaluate that unless you have more data. Um, and I think you'd be a perfect candidate to get a metabolomic test, which looks deep inside the body to look at other things that you can't see from a simple blood test. That's what I would do. Uh, I have done a video on that. If you could, you want to search it on my website and there's a place where you can get a metabolomic testing because, you know, typically when you have these spots and things, um, when I talk about them, I'm, if they're, they're usually in the peripheral part of your body, where in the lower part of the, the feet or the, the legs or the, um, where you get poor circulation. But when you have it like what you have, there's something else going on, especially without anything else, any other data, like that's a difficult one. So it's one of those things. It's like, how, how are you going to figure that out? It's like not very common. You, you need, you need a deeper test other than just a regular blood test. It's called metabolomic testing. Uh, I think I have, I should probably put on my website because I, um, I did a video on it with, um, it says Dr. Berg's doctor and talks about this testing that you can do a, you can work with someone remotely just to figure out what's going on at a deeper level because um, it's a bit of a mystery and I have no clue. I've never even heard of that disease before. Okay, well, good luck with that. Thank you for a very prompt. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah, man. You made up for uh, Jean, who we really love, but she kind of went on and ate up, ate up the clock. But thank you, sir. And i uh, love to hear back on some great successes uh, in your case. And I tell you what, let's go to uh, let's do the ask quiz question number three. Let's go back to uh, social media. Lou Yu from YouTube. My blood ketones are 0.7 and my urine ketones are 8. After three hours of fasting, why the discrepancy? Uh, are those numbers good enough to burn fat? You're in fat burning um, because there's ketones being generated. Um, I think the more accurate way is just to stick with the blood test because um, that way you could um, see what's going on. It's more consistent than the urine. And uh, if you wanted to increase more fat burning or ketosis, we, you want to add this thing called exercise and fasting go longer fasting and those ketones will start increasing more and more and more oh sorry i was just calculating the question here okay so we got an answer for quiz question number three let's bring it up uh why is it dangerous for a person with insulin resistance a uh, high carb diet uh let's see uh, 90 percent say diabetes and 10 percent say triggers insulin uh, what do we have there doc so here's what's happening. Most of the population has insulin resistance. And what this means is that you're, you're not very um, flexible with your mitochondria. Your metabolism is not very flexible to switch what type of fuel that you burn. And so um, if you're doing a lot of carbohydrates on top of insulin resistance, um, your poor mitochondria can't can't use that fuel efficiently. You're not able to burn it. So there's, so what happens to that glucose? It backs up into the system 
into your blood, having high blood glucose. So, so in other words, these pre-diabetics, diabetics, people with insulin resistance, when they do a lot of carbs, their, their mitochondria is not using that energy because they're not very metabolically flexible. That is the danger and it's very dangerous. So um, this is why if someone has insulin resistance, the worst thing they can do is consume carbs just because they're not going to be able to burn it. And it's just going to back up in the system. So a, a better solution would be to go low carb. And then um, that way you can bypass this whole thing and start feeding the body uh, ketones because you don't have resistance to ketones. Your body will suck them up, start using that and you'll start healing. Uh, but it, it does not burn glucose very well. So that's, that's one big problem. Mm. Okay. YouTube, let's go to Jacqueline Samuel. Is it better to buy organic or pasture raised chicken? Is there a difference? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question because organic just means without, um, hormones and pesticides and things like that. But free range, I think it, free range allows, um, was it 12 feet, 12 feet to live in a space of 12 feet by 12 feet. Um, so they get more space. What you really want is pasture raised, which I think is, it's a little bit more, but even then, you know, it's like these poor chickens don't have a lot of space, like cage free is still probably a foot space. And, uh, but they're still in like this barn. So, I mean, ideally you want organic and pasture raised and, um, or just, I mean, f go to the farmer's market right now, our chickens are laying way too many eggs. And I would love to just give you our eggs because we don't know what to do with them. But these chickens get to roam out into the woods all around the yard and, um, eat worms and stuff. And, uh, what, what I recently did is switch, um, the feed because even though I had organic feed and this is interesting, the organic feed that I was feeding did have organic corn and soy. And when I went to test those eggs, they were still high in omega six. So now I switched, switched it to an organic feed or a non GMO feed to no corn, no soy. I'm going to send the eggs in probably in two weeks and then I will let you know the result, but it should be lower than that omega six. And that is one little problem with this, um, these eggs. I mean, it's not as bad as seed oils, but still it'd be ideal to start lowering that omega six and going higher with the omega three. Wow. Fascinating study. Can't wait to hear about that. Here's quiz question number uh, four for the day, doc. Okay. True or false. Only 10% of your vitamin D comes from our diet. Ah, that's interesting. Okay, let me check that off. And let's go back to our green room for some real efficient things here. We've got uh, David from Brooklyn, New York. David, I'm going to unmute you. And I can hear that your mic is working. And you're on for a quick question with Dr. Berg. Go ahead. All right. Hi, doctor. Hi. Uh, about three years ago, when I was 30 years old, I began having seizures for the first time in my life. I've had a total of nine seizures, and all the tests that were done came back looking normal, and the doctors don't know what started causing the seizures to happen. And I recently watched a video of yours on YouTube called The Dangers and Benefits of Alkaline Water, and noticed that you mentioned if someone were to have alkalosis, it's possible that it can cause them to have a seizure. So my question is, how would I know if I had alkalosis and if it's the cause, of, the cause of my seizures? And is there anything I can do to get the seizures to stop happening other than taking the medication that was prescribed by the doctor? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, I think um, I highly doubt you have alkalosis. It's, uh, it's rare. And um, especially if you don't have an alkalizing machine and you're dumping all this alkaline water in your body, if, you don't, if you're not having that, I, I think it's going to be rare, very rare for that to be a situation. Um, I think, um, the best bet for you is to get on, um, a really low carb diet because it's been known to reduce seizures big time. But this is the key with, with that type of ketogenic diet that's slightly different than other ketogenic diets. We want to go, um, deeper into ketosis. So we, we don't want to do, um, high protein. We want to do moderate protein, but definitely high fat. That ratio of higher fat, 
to moderate protein and then really low carb would be really good. And the carbs that you can probably consume would be, you know, of course the vegetables and things, cooked vegetables would be good uh, if they're like anything other than salad and um, some berries, but keep your carbs low. That is going to be probably your best bet uh, for seizures. Um, there's a lot of other remedies that you could take, but I think that foundation, if you're not already doing it, is going to be your best bet. Um, yeah. And then I would love for you to come back on in a couple of weeks and tell us if how, how you went, because there's other things you can do, but I would, that would be the most important thing. So I could come back in a couple of weeks and tell you how it goes, but right now I'm currently still on the medication. I actually only started taking medication after the eighth seizure mm-hmm. and I've had one while I was on the medication. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's actually very interesting because the first eight happened between the hours of five and 7 a.m. when I was kind of transitioning from sleep to waking up. And the last seizure when I was on medication happened at 10 p.m. while I was awake. The only one while I was actually awake. Wow. So I'm not, so I'm not sure how that plays a fact. So, you know, the way the medical profession looks at this is that, uh, yeah, ketogenic diet is it's called the traditional ketogenic diet is good for medication-resistant seizures. <laughs> so they they tend to try the medication first, and if that doesn't work, then they'll go to the ketogenic diet. It's one of those things you're going to have to decide, um, should you do both at the same time? Should you try one and then the other? I can't tell you what to do, but I, but, but it, the question, would it hurt to do both at the same time? The problem is you're not going to know what's working. Right. So you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because... Um, you want to isolate one variable at a time. Um, you know, and then the other question is, is the medication creating other side effects? I I have no idea. So I guess all I guess I can provide you is a, a solution that I would do. That's more natural that, that potentially could work if you choose to do it. Um, but you'd have to test it out. Okay. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Great, great question. We hope that uh, works out for you and it does sound a little confusing, but, uh, I'm sure we'll get some results back from you. So thanks for chiming in with that one. Uh, let's go back to social media, who I mean, we've been a little neglected today, and so we apologize for that. Let's see. Uh, Manjola from YouTube, do uh, hormonal monthly changes affect the kidneys? What can I do to avoid getting puffy or waterlogged during certain days of the cycle? Obviously a woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, there's definitely this uh, hormonal cycle that can put you in this fluid retention situation. And I think what, what um, you know, if it happens, it'd be helpful to know what does it happen during ovulation or does it happen during menstruation? Like, where, or does it happen the, the week before your cycle where you have high levels of progesterone? So you can isolate like what hormones involved. Um, but it could just be, an exaggeration or too much of one of the hormones that are involved in this cycle. Um, I, I'm I probably more likely you're going to need to kind of buffer this uh, estrogen effect. And to do that, I would use starting out iodine. That's the best way to kind of control excessive amounts of estrogen. And you can take sea kelp right before that, um, uh, that, that period that you get swelling and see if that doesn't help. The other thing that can help counter swelling is more potassium um, versus the sodium. So try those things out and then let us know if that worked. All right. Very good. Let's go to, hang on, I'm getting some noise back there from somewhere. Let's go to our quiz question answer. The the quiz question number four, true, false, only 10% of our vitamin D comes from our diet and our audience tended to agree 99% 99% say that's true. 1% is holding out hope for false. So we got 90% and 1%. What about the other 9 No, 99, I must have said. 99 versus 1. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, it's true. Um, it's really hard to get your vitamin D. Actually, it's impossible to get it from the food. And you have to be consuming the fatty fish, the cod liver oil, the egg yolks, things like that. So where does the vitamin D come from? The sun. But who's out in the sun as often as they should be? They're usually not. So, um, you know, I think there's been a huge shift 
uh, and I don't know what year that was, that people are told to avoid the sun because it's dangerous. And if you're on the sun, use the sun blockers, right? Or the sun lotion, whatever to protect. Um, boy, that's just really cut down that vitamin D. Now, I think the biggest concern with the sun is uh, melanomas, which is uh, the most deadly type of skin cancer. But you know what's interesting about melanomas? I have, I've been looking at this for quite some time and the incidence or risk of melanoma go down with more exposure to the sun. I'm not talking about going out and burning your skin, but that's interesting that um, skin, I mean, the sun even protects against melanoma and 75% of all melanomas are in areas of your body that don't even, are not exposed to the skin. So I think there's a, a vitamin D component, protective um, component, as well as a melatonin from the infrared that protects us against the melatonin, which is fascinating. So um, stay tuned for a video on the benefit of sun. There's a lot of benefits that you might not even know about. All right, let's pitch up our last question. We got them all this week, which is fun, and there it is. Okay, what is the opposing mineral to sodium in, involved in blood pressure regulation? You know, these are really, uh, Lori and I are saying, these are fun questions. We learn new stuff every week, and then I promptly forget it, but oh well. Uh, let's see, so Paula from YouTube, I tend to get the runs after eating meat or eggs. I have no gallbladder. Uh, what can I do to stop this reaction? I think you're, you're missing your flora. Now, because you don't have a gallbladder, there, obviously there's, a, there's probably too much bile uh, going through there because usually if you are deficient in bile, you're going to be more constipated. So I think you'd probably have to evaluate your stool to see if your stool floats or is pale or gray or leaves skid marks, in which case you need more bile. So I don't think that's the case. I think you have too much bile, in which case you have to... Um, get with your doctor on a medication that they use for this to kind of slow down the bile production. Um, but your microbes make bile. And if you're eating certain things and you're not uh, forming that stool, I, I tend to, I would first try to fix the microbiome by maybe adding more probiotics, things like that. Uh, maybe some kefir, sauerkraut to, uh, get your microbes in place. And so you could form the stool. But um, in, in the meantime, you're going to have to find other proteins and foods that don't do that. Maybe you do lamb or goat meat or something like that, or pork or something like that. All right. Very good. Melneg from YouTube again. While on OMAD, how many grams of protein and fat should you aim for in that particular meal? Well, it depends on several things, your age, how much lean body mass you have. Um, I'm 185, 188 pounds. Um, I need probably maybe 60, 65 grams of protein per meal. Some people will do a lot more. Um, some people do less. So I think that's like an average amount. So, I mean, if you're female, maybe you just have uh, the protein that is the size of the palm of your hand. If you're male, you could have like twice that. So there's just guidelines. It's something you're going to have to test out because you have, you know, your physical fitness. If you, how much are you training your metabolism, your ability to process protein, your hydrochloric acid, your stress level, like there's a lot of other factors. So um, you're gonna have to test the water, see what you feel best on. Um, with the metabolomic testing, it's interesting because that'll just pick it right up to see if you're having enough protein, like the input to make sure everything works. Um, so, but if you're not doing that, you, you can just kind of go by how you feel. So you'll definitely, if you're not having enough protein, you can feel weak. Um, and especially if you exercise. All right. Very good. Well, in, in that same vein, dusty steel from YouTube is it best to have more fat than protein with little to no carbs? 
Well, that's, yeah, that's really good for someone that's not metabolically flexible. That's really good for someone that has insulin resistance. Um, so they can just run on ketones. Um, so yes, that would be a good, good thing to do. All right. And here's when I feel sorry for ZZ who wants to know, uh, what to do for stage three hemorrhoids. I didn't know they staged them, but that sounds like, uh, you're well along with them. Fenugreek is a good, um, herb for that. Also, um, I have a video on that. You can look, there's, uh, several, uh, modalities and, um, therapies using light therapy. Um, but I would suspect a liver problem. It's a venous issue, like a collapse of the venous structure. So that's usually related to liver support. So you'd I have a whole video on that. You can watch that to get the details. Okay, very good. And we've got uh, fast action uh, answers back uh, on our last question, which we're proud to have gotten through today. And it asks, what is opposing mineral to sodium in blood pressure regulation? And 95% say it's potassium. 4% of our respondents say magnesium. And 1% says, um, oh, potassium and magnesium. When we're talking about blood pressure, 90% of all blood pressure is idiopathic. They don't know what causes it. It's called essential or primary. I find, I find that's convenient because what would be the advantage of having a causation for high blood pressure? Um, so they kind of keep it unknown cause. It's a great, it's, um, but here's the thing. If you take a look at some of the top medications, like even five of the top medications out there for blood pressure, every single one of them retains potassium. Could it be the retention of potassium that helps offset this? I mean, there's such a focus on lowering sodium, but what about increasing potassium? Potassium supports the tone of the arteries. It's a, it helps reduce adrenaline, which kind of keeps the pressure high. Um, it's, it's kidney protective unless you have stage four or five can, um, kidney damage where you can't have potassium. It's good for pre preventing problems with that. Um, it's almost impossible to get enough potassium because um, you need 4,700 milligrams every single day. And who's going to get that unless they consume a lot of greens, which people don't. So um, potassium is one of those uh, deficiencies that, I mean, if you try to get a potassium pill, it only comes in 99 milligrams. So you'd need 47 tablets a day. No one's going to do that. So you can get electrolyte powder, but the point is that um, the opposing mineral to sodium is potassium. And that's the one that I would focus on if I had a high blood pressure. Well, the audience seems to agree. Okay. Lou Yu from YouTube. That's what it rhymes, I guess. Will I lose weight faster by cutting out dairy? Should I also cut out salami? I'm Italian. I could live on salami and cheese, says Lou Yu. No, you can't, you can't cut out salami. That's like, that's just like, you can't go that far. Um, cheese, you know, some good Italian cheese. Um, that's going to be, I don't know how much cheese you're eating. I think for some people it, it can, um, be a, be a problem, but I consume a good amount of cheese. I don't, I think if you don't have an allergy, I think if you have high quality cheese, I don't think it's going to affect the weight. And most people, but it, it may, you have to test the waters, but I would hate to have you not consume cheese and salami. I mean, that's like a, that's a staple food for so many people. Is there any sarcasm in that doc? No. Okay. No. Good. Great. I think, I, I think, I mean, I, yeah, I consume um, a lot of European cheese and as well as salami. I think it's a, it can be very healthy. Oh, good. Well, Lou, go for it. Okay, TB, do fermented sauerkraut type products contain sugar or is sugar a, uh, a product of the fermentation? Well, it's not a product of the fermentation, but the microbes use um, the carbs in that cabbage to ferment. So they don't add sugar to that. It's just the carb that they, the microbes live off um, the crowd, the, the cabbage, and it turns it into this interesting um, new 
product that has a lot more friendly bacteria and, and broken down, easy to digest um, particles and things like that, as well as lactic acid, other organic acids that are really good for your digestive system and a lot of vitamin C. So no, they don't add sugar to it. Okay, let's see. David from Rumble. I'm 18 years old, kind of skinny and always hungry, even after eating. Sounds like a healthy teenager to me. Yeah, I think um, you may just want to um, do what everyone else does in America. Sit on the couch, watch a lot of TV, <laughs> don't exercise. No, um, I would I would just increase more calories and um, also more fat calories to sustain you a little bit more. Um, but try to keep the quality in there. And that way you won't end up like Steve. All right, or I'm sorry, me. Carrie. You basically ruin the metabolism and then you, you're you dealing with uh, pr- complications of that later in life. Well, but now you can't lose weight, right? So I think um, that's what I would do. Yeah, well, luckily I have Lori who fat shames me every time I go up an ounce. It's unbelievable. I'm sure that the helps. Abuse. I'm yeah. sure that well, helps. You shame. Your mind. You got to remind people about shame and its utility and, and living a good life. Let's see. We talked about him. Oh, Tanum 12, how can I improve low platelets? I don't know. I think... Um, is there, is there, do you have a condition that's creating it? Is, is there a problem with um, your diet? I would just look at the, I would look at the, go to the basics and see um, what else are you eating that could be interfering with it? Are you on some medications that usually can create a problem with that? Um, because I just need more data to evaluate that. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, well, let's try Sarah from YouTube. Is prolonged fasting advisable for someone who has no thyroid and still on thyroid meds? It's a really good question because the thyroid um, is sensitive to longer fasts because it's all it's all it's all about metabolism, right? So, and getting enough calories, and you have to kind of have uh, be a bit more flexible with your metabolism for the thyroid to deal with longer fast. I would try it out. You may be, you might be totally fine, but just see how you feel. The the key with the longer fast is that when you do them, does your appetite go away? Do you feel really good or do you feel like crap? Then you're not ready yet. And the thyroid is um, not quite ready to do that work. So with the thyroid, you may, um, do better with a little less fasting and bring your carbs up to maybe 50 grams with the, with the berries and see if that doesn't help, um, with that, uh, conversion from T4 to T3, because sometimes when you're not adapted to ketosis and you try to do it, the thyroid's like, struggling because you have this um, adrenal thing in the background that's trying to keep the blood sugars up and that can interfere with with the um, thyroid. That being said, um, you know, I think um, you don't have a thyroid now, so you're on medications. So um, just realize if you're on medications, if you could get your doctor to do more of a natural uh, hormone therapy, that would be a little bit better because usually they give you Synthroid, which is a synthetic T4. But what about all the other things that the thyroid thyroid makes? Calcitonin. um, And also, what about your conversions? Do you you have all the nutrients to make this conversion from T4 to T3? These are all factors that I would look at because you might need selenium, you might need iron, you might need zinc. Uh, to really make this thing work. So I I think it's just not a simple answer. You got to look at the whole picture. Okay, very good. Can we stretch one more question? I'd like to get it from Donna from Facebook. What should I take to eliminate gallstones in the gallbladder? And most people that get their gallbladder ripped out doesn't seem to really improve life a lot from what I've heard. So um, she has gallstones and she's trying to debate what to do to shrink them? Well, yeah, how to, to eliminate them, I guess, without surgery maybe. Well, I think um, to understand what a gallstone is, 
it's a, it's a super concentrated cholesterol stone that occurred because you don't have enough bile. So what you need to do is increase more bile so you can dissolve the stone. So I would start taking bile salts after the meal, but also there's other things to do to increase your bile production. Milk thistle is one great remedy. Um, consuming um, artichokes, um, what else? Uh, um, dandelion greens, beets are all good to increase more bile production. Uh, don't go extremely low fat, but don't go high fat right now too, because um, that's what stimulates the production of bile. Uh, you might benefit from some betaine hydrochloride, uh, which actually will help your digest your stomach. So then you could actually release the uh, more bile because that's really what you need. You're probably suffering from a bile deficiency. And one last thing about um, something that protects you against forming stones is having enough melatonin. You might benefit from taking melatonin before bed too, um, because melatonin is produced by cells in your bile ducts that actually help as an antioxidant to protect things from start to, to build up. Um, so they can keep, not only keep the stones from developing, but keep the inflammation down and keep, uh, things from scarring up. And on that note, I appreciate all of your attention. Stay tuned for some more uh, videos tomorrow. Have a wonderful weekend and we will see you next week.